Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jody Guest, and I am an infectious disease epidemiologist, professor, and vice chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Rollins School of Public Health here at Emory University. I lead Emory's COVID-19 outbreak response team, which is the topic of today's video. I'm also the host for Emory's COVID-19 videos where we bring you the latest about the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by some of the outbreak response team to discuss the work we've been doing and the lessons we have learned from the communities we've worked in. As some background, Emory's outbreak response team began in April of 2020 to respond to COVID-19 outbreaks and the inequitable risk being seen in poultry plants in North Georgia. At our very first testing event, we tested more than 1,000 people in three hours and caused massive traffic jams in Gainesville. Since that time, we have performed more than 10,000 COVID-19 tests and brought vaccinations to communities where vaccine uptake was low and where access was limited. As we think about this past year, we have seen cases go from a total of 32 million cases in the United States in May of 2021 to 82 million cases as we begin May of 2022. 60% of our total U.S. cases have just been in the last 12 months. As we have gone from 570,000 deaths from COVID-19 in the U.S. alone, also in May of 2021, to 991,000 deaths as of the beginning of May 2022, this has been an incredibly hard year. However, though these numbers are staggering, the good news is that the United States in the past year alone has gone from 32% fully vaccinated to 66% fully vaccinated. So at this point in time, I'd like to be joined by my colleagues and friends, our four students that we're going to hear from today, Emmy, Cheeky, Bathor, and Aaron, all who graduate on Saturday with their master's in public health. All four of these students are part of a team of nine students who've spent the last year working with the outbreak response team. And they're here today to talk about the work we've done and the lessons we have learned. Our team has spent many weekends and nights of talking about and providing vaccinations in Atlanta and other areas of the state, with a total of 36 pop-up testing and vaccination sites in the past 12 months. So let's start there. To any one of you who wants to jump in first, what are some of the favorite places we've been across the state in the past 12 months? I think for me, um... I'm struggling between Woodruff Park and Fort Valley. Woodruff Park because I made some of my first friends there and Fort Valley because it's very calm and peaceful out there. Wonderful, thank you. Before, anyone else? Yeah, I think Woodruff Park is um, probably up there. We've referred to it at times as our home away from home um, since we've been there several times and safe house as well. I think just the locations that we keep returning to and really um, cement those relationships are probably some of my favorites. I think as we think about the places we've been, the fact that we consistently return to locations, um, there have been a few that have been further away that we've not gone to more than once, but those who are in the metro Atlanta area are a little bit closer. We've been back to many times. How important has that been um, to consistently go back and to recognize people and be recognized in the communities we've worked in? I think it's crucial because it builds trust. Um, when they see us out there over and over again, we see uh, some folks, you know, eventually go ahead and get vaccinated just based on that and based on the experience that other folks have had with us. So just building that trust in the community uh, through repeat visits has been really important. Thank you, Erin. Right, Emmy, you've been um, really responsible for helping set up a lot of the logistics for the events we've gone to and been um, our main connection to a bunch of our community partners that we've worked with in the past couple of months. Can you tell us about some of the community partners we've worked with the most? Absolutely. Um, that was something that I took on about halfway through, and it's been really amazing to see um, how that process works, how we get community partners, how we keep those relationships, and some of the ones that we have worked with several times. Um, the Emory PA program um, is often our clinical team at the events, and it is so great to see um, be able to bring in another part of Emory and see kind of their training work with what we're doing to be able to deliver those vaccinations. 
Um, and then some ones outside of Emory. Um, we've worked with the mayor's office several times, um, Healing Community Center, Fair Count. Um, all of these organizations help us make the events happen, get them scheduled. And it's really amazing because um, it makes it allows us to go more places than we could if we were just trying to make it happen on our own. And I think one of the reasons our community partners have been so incredibly important is that it's not just us coming and joining um, a, an area of a community or on a corner of a neighborhood, but it's really us um, getting the value of folks who are already there and saying that they know us and that they trust us and that that really affords some additional trust in the community as they learn who we are and why we might be there. Um, so Erin, as, as you think about um, the different approaches that we've used to talk to folks as we approach them in, in, you know, on the streets, in the communities, or as they come up to us in events, what are some of the best ways you've learned to talk to, to people as they come to us and ask questions about vaccinations? Yeah, so um, our first semester, uh, what I learned from a biostatistics professor actually was that great research comes with great humility. And I think that applies to public health service as well, most definitely. So the first thing I would say is to, to humble yourself. Um, when you're entering into some of these conversations, um, you have to show that you care. They don't really care that much what, care that much what you know. Um, and you can't just act humble. Um, and this isn't a performance. You, you really have to uh, feel it and and show it because we don't have all the answers. I mean, even the most foremost uh, infectious disease experts, we're going into year three of this thing. Um, there's still, you know, some unknowns out there and some uncertainty, and we have to carry that with us into these conversations and know that what's right for somebody else may not be right for me and vice versa. Um, the second thing I would say is simply just to listen. And by listening, I mean active listening, not just waiting to talk. Um, we don't get paid commission for getting people vaccinated. We're out here, we're just having conversations. Um, and you never know where that conversation may lead. So listening is key. And the pandemic has really been hard on a lot of people. There's been a lot of social isolation. So an added bonus, I think for, for a lot of us is just being out there talking to strangers. Um, <laughs> it's actually been kind of fun at times. So I would say be humble, listen, um, you know, those are a couple of things that have been reinforced for me through the ORT. And I think there are probably a couple of lessons that public health at large, um, you know, needs to understand and, and do maybe a little bit better at. Thank you for that. I think it's really um, important to also remember, as you pointed out, so much of our time in the past two years has felt more isolated. And so um, while the work we have done has been so incredibly important um, for communities, it's also been important, I think, for us individually to have the connections that we formed with each other and those in the communities, because you're right, sometimes these were the most amount of people we would see in one location. Um, as we thought, we were just talking yesterday in one of our meetings about how many people we thought we had talked to for every one person we vaccinated. Does anyone want to kind of give some of those estimates we were bouncing around yesterday? I think we're talking within the range of several thousands. Because mm -hmm. off of the top of my head, I had several no's. And comparing to comparing it with the number of people we successfully um, We've got vaccinated, it will be several thousands. Yeah. So we set a marker of success for every event we went to as being a conversation. If we had a conversation with one person, even if they didn't find their way to a vaccination that particular time, we found that to, to be our marker of success that we wanted to strive for. And so I think it's really important to recognize, I think some events we were talking on average to 25 people to every one person we vaccinated or something like that. So you know, this is a lot of communication and conversations that we've had um, every time we go out there. Before, would you mind um, talking about how this feels different than what you learned in the classroom? You've just completed two years worth of coursework but how did this add to your education or your thoughts about working as a public health professional? 
Right. So um, this experience actually highlighted the need for diversity in public health. Mm. Um, during our different visits to Woodruff Park, there were several instances where people only talk, interact with me because I'm the Black man in the group. And they felt like I could understand the reasons why they are vaccine hesitant. And these re reactions are very valid. And I understood because of the dark history pertaining to some public health interventions leading to general mistrust. And so I think it's imperative that for our programs to thrive going forward and for our initiatives to be more um, effective, we must um, build public health capacity and more importantly, um, encourage diversity in different levels of public health. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. As, as we traveled around um, the northern half of the state in particular and had lots and lots of conversations, the way um, that we learned was most effective when we were out in the community, did that change the way any of you talked with your family and friends about vaccinations or even um, additional COVID-19 information as it was changing over the past year? Yes, I was much more understanding of um, folks who are unwilling to get vaccinated yet and um, folks who really wanted to open up the dialogue to include different points of view. Um, so I would say it absolutely changed my, my point of view from the, the outset of the vaccine um, delivery to, to where we are now. I mean, I think there was a huge push to get everybody vaccinated right away and everybody wanted this thing so badly but in reality you know there's there's a long-term aspect to this that we have to kind of understand and um you know going back to the humility piece not pushing people away because somebody who's not willing to get vaccinated today they might get it a year from now you know and you don't want to push them down a path to where they'll never get it um so to answer your question, yeah, you know, my, my point of view is certainly a little bit different now than at the beginning. And, and Shiki, that brings up a, a topic that we talked about a lot. So we, we tried to enforce the idea of a layered approach to vaccinations. And, you know, can you kind of walk us through what we mean by that? Yes. So essentially, it's kind of referring to the idea that we're meeting people with where they are with their attitudes and feelings towards COVID-19 testing and vaccines. So, you know, people are kind of on a spectrum with how comfortable they feel with receiving the vaccine, especially as Aaron just touched on, we've seen multiple kind of booster recommendations in the last few months, um, in addition to the first or first two doses, depending on what type of vaccine you got. So a lot of people were and still aren't super hesit are hesitant to receive the vaccine. They might not receive it after the initial conversation we have with them, but just kind of talking about COVID-19 in general. And you know, we're not really going into these conversations as only an epidemiologist, but first and foremost, kind of as a human recognizing another human, their experiences and their concerns. So the layered approach really kind of just goes back to emphasizing the importance of returning back to the same testing and vaccine sites to build trust and kind of like a consistent rapport with the community, kind of like you and Aaron touched on earlier. Thank you. So, I think um, we all recognize that a lot has changed in the past 12 months. We've seen two variants. They have been slightly different in the way they have functioned and the way cases have come about, um, but they both caused massive waves of both cases and deaths and, and hospitalizations. Uh, vaccine eligibility expanded in the past 12 months, which was fantastic news. We also saw the first recommendation for a booster, and now we have a second recommendation for a booster in a, in a particular population. That's a lot of changes to stay on top of. How have you gone about staying on top of this really quickly changing information, and how important is that for you to feel like you know the latest of what's going on? Okay, so um, I'd say our weekly meetings, which were usually led by you, were, were a good source of information, updated information. And hats off to Chiki and Emmy. They did phenomenally well each week, keeping the group updated on happenings in Georgia and the United States by presenting COVID-related data each week. Personally, discovering Epi Twitter was a game changer for me. It gave me 
additional reliable information and variable um, varying perspectives from public health experts from around the world who are working at different levels of pand the pandemic response. Anyone else want to add anything about how you've tried to stay on top of this just massive amounts of information that we've gotten in the past 12 months? Yeah, I would say to echo what Bafor said, I think our team meetings and you in particular, Jody, but also just each other as kind of a resource to be able to not only keep up to date on the latest headlines, but really talk through things and digest and try and apply what we've learned in the classroom to what the latest recommendations mean and how we can communicate that to the people that we're going to be going out to serving, um, I think was probably the most helpful thing and also was really important to the work we were doing and communicate uh, conversations that I had with my family. All of a sudden they were looking to me as a public health expert and I said, I'm pretty new to this, but I'll tell you how I best understand it and let's have a conversation about it so that we can hopefully both reach a better understanding. That's great. You know, so um, before what he was alluding to was Emmy and Cheeky were for our team part of our um, data presentations every single week and Emmy presented the latest and the greatest in the state of Georgia and Cheeky was giving us kind of where things were going the best and where things were not going the best by state and territory for the United States. And um, I will additionally say that when we were confused by information. Um, our team was willing to contact state and local health department folks and ask specific questions and bring it back so that we were always all learning together. And, um, and that, that team effort, I think, made it, it easier for all of us to stay on top of all of it. Every single one of you on this outbreak response team, the four of you and the, and the rest of the students, for a total of nine of you, you've all been in school only during the pandemic for public health. So I can only imagine how this has changed um, the ways you've thought about what you might wanna do. And so, you know, what, what's something you take from um, the outbreak response team that's really gonna change the way you're going to um, serve in a career for public health? I'd love to hear from any of you about this. Well, the word that we've heard several times today is serve. And um, I mean, I only came to the School of Public Health because of the pandemic. And I envision more of a research role. But over the past couple of years, and specifically my experience in the ORT has led me to uh, incorporate service more in terms of my personal mission statement and my personal attitude uh, towards my future career. So. Right now, I'm hoping to be a you know a servant to the state of Georgia and specifically the Metro Atlanta area in terms of the COVID-19 response. Thank you, Aaron. I love that. I think this kind of goes hand in hand with what Aaron just said, but really taking putting a face to the numbers of what we do in public health. You know, I feel like it's one thing to go watch the news or read headlines about the numbers of people who have gotten sick or numbers of people who have passed away from this disease, but actually engaging with people who you know, do have a fear of the virus and potentially had someone who they loved passed away from it just kind of makes you realize that what we're doing is with people and for people. It's not just sitting at the desk doing some data analysis. Um, so that's what I've really appreciated from this experience. Thank you, Cheeky. I mean, before you guys want to add anything, otherwise I have a bit of a surprise for you guys. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I would just say I have a pretty similar experience. I think I came in thinking I wanted to be like behind a computer all the time, getting deep into some data, like doing lots of analysis. And, and I like that. And, you know, I'd love to be able to continue doing parts of that. But I think what I was really missing and what I found in the outbreak response team was um, the ability to engage with the community and really understand, as Chiki was saying, why we're doing what we're doing um, and see, I think, really learn directly that humility. We talk about it a lot in our classes, but I think you really don't get it until you talk to somebody and you get a chance to say, 
what's going on with you? And then the next person, okay, and, and what's happening for you? And really see that there's um, statistics and then there's a million different personal reasons that people have for making their decisions and what we can do to um, help guide them towards um, good public health decisions. Thank you. I think Aaron mentioned this earlier in some shape or form, but it highlighted the importance of partnerships, both um, within the school of public health and outside of it and in the community as well. And it's um, showed the importance of showing up multiple times because we have different encounters where at one event, somebody will say no, subsequently, after having had one or two conversations, subsequently, if we went back there, they were in to try and get vaccinated or they got vaccinated elsewhere. And I think that's key because like, at the end of the day, we're adding value to people to make better, better health, health choices. And I think that's important. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we have learned from the people we've spoken with in the community and our community partners, as much as we've been able to try to bring good information and answer questions appropriately, I know I have learned, I have learned con constantly from you and from people we've spoken with and our community partners. And so I think that that to me is also an incredibly important part of what we've done is, you know, every single conversation we've had has helped shape me and the way I think about um, um, engaging in community work. All right, I want to um, briefly call out and acknowledge the rest of this outbreak response team. So uh, in addition to Aaron, Emmy, Bafour, and Cheeky, the outbreak response team also is made up of Brady Bennett, Sylvia Chapa, Sashawn Lawrence, Bianca Perez, and Joanne Wu. Um, and I wanted to show you guys a small recap of what our year has looked like. So give me just a moment to share my screen. All right, that was a lot of places we went. Those are a lot of memories. Um, I would love as you get ready to graduate, if you would give me the privilege of hearing one of your favorite memories from the past year um, and the work that we've done. Who would like to go first? Um, I have a few really favorite memories, but I actually just remembered this one this morning when I was thinking about the, this for this afternoon. Um, there's a f oh, there was a day last summer where before Joanne and I went to Grove Park to go canvas and put up a lot of flyers. And I think we maybe did that two or three times last summer. Um, and that was always before our events at that one church. I can't remember the name of it. Um, but it was just really nice to be able to go to those areas before we actually did our events there to help kind of spread the word about what was going to be happening. And we didn't know each other super well then yet. So it was also like a good time to bond with Bafour and Joanne. Um, so that's probably one of my favorite memories. Wonderful, thank you, Cheeky. Honestly, for me, I think there are several. So <laughs> it's very hard for me to pick. Um, from figuring out the logistics of taking group pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time 
you you set the timer on your camera phone, you took off one shoe, <laughs> positioned your camera phone in the shoe, and quickly ran back to join us to take the picture. And from that to um, several car carpool conversations to and from the vaccine or testing events. I think um, we came in as strangers who are trying to get our MPH degrees and we're leaving as um, friends and colleagues who are ready to make a difference. And I'm grateful for every step of this journey, really. I love that before, thank you. Uh, for me, I would say the Georgia Capitol um, mm -hmm. event, there's four or five stories I could tell from that event alone. We vaccinated, but mostly boosted, I think over a hundred people. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, you know, kind of what before was saying, just the ORT for me was a difference maker in my experience at Rollins. Um, having spent about 15 years in the music industry and then making the decision to come back to school, being dropped in the middle of academia um, was absolute culture shock. <laughs> uh, in the middle of a pandemic, no less, was surreal. And that first year being pretty much all on Zoom, um, you know, I was just that old guy asking questions in class, I'm, I'm sure. So to have, you know, friends and colleagues on the team and get to know a little bit and provide that bridge um, to the university and have that connection. And of course, with you, Dr. Guest, um, having looked out for me, you know, as much as you have over the past two years has been um, very special. And I don't really want to think about Rollins without this experience. It's, it's been a game changer. Thank you. I feel the same way. This for me, and I'm going to let you go next, Emmy, but the outbreak response team has been um, a game changer for me for the past, for the pandemic, the entire duration of it. Emmy? Um, I think I as well have just a million little constellations of memories of us working together and growing closer and um, I'm so thankful for this group of friends <laughs> that I've made, but another story I would love to tell just because I think it was such a, um, it was early on and it was like such an example of like, okay, what we're doing is, is working for us. Um, we were at Safe House and there was, um, they were doing a food distribution and so there's a line of people and we were kind of getting to them before they could even go get their food. And, um, you know, and you're going down the line. And so people see you coming a mile away and they know why you're coming. <laughs> and I walked up to this one guy and I was like, hey. And he was like, <laughs> I said, fair enough. Have a good night. And, um, and didn't end up circling back to him. But I did see like maybe an hour or two later him walking away from having gotten his shot. Mm. And so... I know I talked to the rest of the team eventually and found out somebody else had talked to him. He had ended up being willing to engage in a conversation and ultimately did get vaccinated. And so I think that was a microcosm of like that layered communication that we're doing that usually we don't get to see that final outcome. Um, but I think it helps just give evidence that it's there and that we were doing something that made a difference. And I'm glad we were doing it together. Me too. Me too. I think at that exact same event, Emmy, I, there was someone that we'd seen a, a couple of times before then when we'd been at safe house and they had not gotten vaccinated but they came up to me when we were there that particular time and said hey jody i want you to know i got vaccinated last week and so this person had talked to me several times and um and remembered my name and was willing to come up and share that with me and was really excited to get to tell me not as excited as I was to hear it, I don't even think, but um, you know, those relationships, the relationships with the people we've worked with, the places we've gone back to, and the relationships with each of you. This is, this is, this is good stuff. I appreciate you all being here today to talk about what Emory's Outbreak Response Team has done in the past 12 months. 
I am incredibly proud of each one of you and the rest of the team as you guys graduate on Saturday. Um, and I cannot wait to see all the incredible work that you will do as you serve the state of Georgia, as you serve wherever it is you're going to be in public health. You guys are gonna be shining lights. So congratulations to each one of you. And thank you for everyone watching today. Thank you for letting us share a little bit about what we've been doing the past 12 months, how incredibly proud I am of this team and these students and the great work that they have done to change lives for the state of Georgia. Thank you all, have a great afternoon.